So this brings us to kinetics, and unlike statics that only requires Newton's first and third laws, in dynamics we need Newton's second law. So recall that the linear momentum of a particle with mass m and velocity v is m times v, and Newton's second law states that the rate of change of linear momentum is the sum of the external forces acting on the body, which gives us that the sum of the forces F is equal to ddt of mv, and since the mass is constant, this is mass times acceleration. And this is Newton's second law. The sum of the external forces here shown as F1 and F2 equals mass times acceleration A. We could also write this in terms of components of the force and acceleration in normal and tangent components, and here we would have the tangent and normal components of the force, the tangent and normal components of the acceleration, and so Newton's second law would be that the sum of the tangent components, Ft, equals m times At, and recall from our early analysis this is m times the rate of change of the magnitude of the velocity. And similarly, the sum of the normal forces equals m times a n, and from our earlier analysis, a n was the magnitude of the velocity squared divided by rho, the radius of curvature of the motion. An alternative and, of course, entirely equivalent way of thinking of Newton's second law is to say that the sum of the external forces is balanced by ma, and so sigma f minus ma is equal to zero. Expressed this way, we call minus ma the inertial vector. In other words, we say that the inertial forces are in dynamic equilibrium with the total of the external forces. So this is simply another entirely equivalent way of thinking about Newton's second law. So either the sum of the external forces gives rise to acceleration, or the inertial forces are balanced by the external forces. We're now ready to apply the equations of motion to a rigid body with center of mass g with respect to a reference frame with origin O and coordinates x, y, z. External forces acting on the body are F1, F2, F3, and F4. Newton's laws tell us that for the motion of the center of mass g with respect to the reference frame, that the sum of the forces must equal the mass of the body times its acceleration. At this point, it's useful to define a new reference frame with its origin at g, we'll call x prime, y prime, and g prime, for the motion of the body with respect to this centroidal reference frame, the external forces also give rise to moments about g whose sum is equal to the rate of change of angular momentum, L dot about g, which is equal to I, the moment of inertia, times the angular acceleration alpha. So this system of external forces is said to be equipolent to the system consisting of M A and I alpha. Now let's consider the special case of a rigid body in plane motion about an axis through its center of gravity perpendicular to the page. With respect to a centroidal reference frame, particles pi in the body have position vector ri and velocity vector vi, and they all have angular velocity omega. The angular momentum of this slab, L sub g, equals the sum from i equals 1 to n of ri prime cross vi prime times delta mi, where delta mi is the fraction of mass of the whole body associated with each particle. 
So therefore i equals 1 to n of ri prime cross omega cross ri prime times delta m sub i. But since omega is constant, this equals omega times the sum of ri prime squared times delta m i, which equals i omega, where i is the mass moment of inertia. Therefore, the rate of change of angular momentum L dot G is equal to I omega dot or I alpha. So again, we have a body with mass M and external forces acting on it that is equipotent to a body with forces MA and moments I alpha about G. We can therefore consider that the combination of these systems of external forces minus the inertial force and the inertial moment must be in balance. They must all add to zero. So this is like a free body diagram for a system that is in motion and accelerating. And we sometimes refer to this as dynamic equilibrium. So D'Alembert showed that one can transform an accelerating rigid body into an equivalent static system by including the inertial force and the inertial torque. The inertial force must act through the center of mass G, but D'Alembert found that the inertial torque can act about any point in the body with the exact same result. This makes the analysis simpler than what we've seen to date, where we've required that the inertial force and the inertial torque must act about the center of mass. So now we can use the free body diagram approach that we use for statics for problems in dynamics as well. Next time we'll discuss work, energy and momentum methods in statics and dynamics.